as Julie said, this is not a political event, but you'll find that as I go through my journey, I'm a very political person. I'm a very controversial person, and it's not something I uh, ascribe to be or want it to be, but it's just the nature of who I am and where I came from. So what I want to do today is to walk you through, um, and all of us have our own journeys that we've gone through you know, in life, and that's what makes life very, very interesting. And MIT provides this amazing environment where you bring people from all different backgrounds, and I think the idea where it gets very, very interesting and where truth emerges is where you can actually have open dialogue and interaction. You know, some of you may know there was a free speech rally. You remember this? And uh, I'm not a Nazi. I'm not a white supremacist. But I can tell you what was interesting about that event is we've gotten in, in an interesting point in human history where are we open to having dialogue of all different spectrums. And that's what you know, I want to compel you to think about because the more we can have dialogue, I think the more we can uh, try to understand or get closer to truth. I know in science, truth is always has a certain level of uncertainty, but the more we can have dialogue about it, we can probably get closer to it. So uh, Kriti's going to, I, I forgot my uh, clicker, Kriti uh, is, uh, works with us. Kriti's actually uh, uh, graduated at MIT, what, last year? Last year. So I want to walk you through these slides, but um, I want to, I'll take about the next 35 minutes to walk through them. Um, I'm going to take you through a journey of my background. Um, it's going to be scholarly. We're going to talk about uh, cytosol, you know, what's going on in systems biology, some of the very interesting developments in genetic engineering, some of the controversies surrounding that. And then I'm going to compel you to think about uh, what is innovation and where does innovation really come from. And I'm going to share it from a, hopefully a very different perspective. So the title of the talk is Innovation Anytime, Anyplace by Anybody. Um, so what I want to share with you is, you know, I grew up in two different worlds. Anyone from India here? Okay, how many of people in India grew up in a village? Okay, not that many. You see, I had two very uh, interesting experiences in India. I was born in India in a city called Bombay. Uh, Bombay, if, if America is a melting pot, Bombay is an industrial furnace. I mean, I grew up with people with all different castes, all different religions, all different uh, you know, economic backgrounds, and everyone lived together in one small environment. So you couldn't avoid the fact that you had people who had no money and the people who had incredible wealth. Um, you know, Christians, Jews, Muslims, everyone got, frankly, worked together and got along. There wasn't uh, this notion of people fighting each other. But this was very different than the uh, environment here. So this is an Indian village. So three to four months I'd spend in this uh, small, deep South Indian village. So imagine uh, going down to Mississippi and then going up to New York. That's how stark these differences were. In fact, we used to take a caboose train to go down here with the old coal caboose. Um, and uh, in that village, these are some of the scenes from it. These are typically one of these small temples, you know, a Hindu temple. Um, and my grandmother, what was interesting, was a small village farmer, meaning she, you know, 16 hours a day, she worked planting in the rice field. She'd come home with leeches on her feet. Um, and these were my grandparents. They were very poor subsistence farmers. And um, there's a picture of my grandmother here. Now, this, she's wearing her typical you know, outfit. This was considered her Sunday best. Uh, you notice that the, the, the holy ash is the Indian Dabudi, and the dot is essentially a, what's called your third eye. But this is what my grandmother looked like on a typical uh, Sunday. But uh, what my grandmother could do uh, was something very interesting, which we would call AI today. But, you know, India has a very interesting history in medicine. There's 5,000 years old of Indian medicine called <coughs> traditional Indian medicine, which uh, is called Siddha or Ayurveda. I'm not going to get into it, but my grandmother was trained by yogis when she was very young. And, uh, uh, you know, I teach a whole course on this, but just like we have genes, proteins, you know, uh, uh, a whole lingua franca to describe Western system of medicine, India too has its own system of medicine starting from creation, uh, types of energy, uh, and to us this may look like woo-woo medicine, that we may not think this is so sophisticated, but I can tell you on weekends my grandmother would probably have 30 or 40 people lined up. Most villages had a local village healer, and she could observe people's face and figure out dysfunctions in their body, and then she would come up with formulations. Now, I know people at the media lab are starting to do this, we call this AI. So when we in the West do this, it, it gets it validated. But you had a woman who had no degrees, tattoos all over her arms, who I saw her empirically heal people. So there was a deep interest I built in medicine as a young kid. Uh, but I also grew up in another aspect of India 
uh, where my grandmother would tell me these amazing epic stories. Anyone remember Beowulf or the Ramayana, Mahabharata? These stories about good versus evil, the story of Ram who fights evil to you know, uh, bring his wife uh, Sita back. And um, you know, and these are just images from it, but one of the things in these stories is there is a deep sense of loyalty. This is Hanuman and Rama, who are these deep, loyal friends who work together. The other aspect of India that I also grew up uh, was a caste system. I don't know if you know, India has a caste system. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't talk about it a lot. Uh, but I was considered a low caste Indian, what you call the quote unquote untouchable, or some people would call it a deplorable. Um, but the, the interesting thing about the Indian caste system is it was very structured. At the top of it was what you would call the priesthood. And the fact that my parents even made it to America in retrospect was quite probably one in a trillion. You're talking about two people who came from very diverse backgrounds. My mom was, as a woman, liberated probably you know, a century before in some ways. Here was a woman who grew up with nothing, somehow got educated her master's. My dad grew up in Burma, in war-torn Burma, came from, uh, didn't get educated until he was 12 years old under a mango tree, but both of them became professionals. It's, it's a whole journey unto itself. You probably do a movie on it. <laughs> so my uh, heroes in India were not what you would call Gandhi was not my hero, okay, which may seem uh, different to many people. My heroes were these fighters like Bhagat Singh. Everyone heard of him? See, in India, uh, and during colonialism, there was one set of people who said, let's accommodate the British, and another set of people who said, we need to have Indian nationalism, very much like the American Revolution. And many uh, scholars today would argue that Gandhi actually supported uh, Indi uh, British colonialism. It's a long, we can discuss that, but people like Bhagat Singh were revolutionaries, crazy horse, you know, the, uh, uh, the American Indian. Uh, next, uh, people like Che. So this is who I studied as a kid. They were not your, you know, your uh, vanilla heroes. And uh, next, so this is me when I was around probably five or six. So this is your typical Indian family. And here in 1970, uh, my parents, very fortunate, we decide to come to the United States. Now you got to understand what 1970 is. It's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> it's post-Vietnam. I mean, it's still Vietnam. And um, here's a very traditional Indian family which leaves India in a little spaceship and comes to Patterson, New Jersey. Anyone been to Patterson? Okay. Patterson was, you know, people with huge uh, froze, afros, right, big uh, Cadillacs. It was a very wild environment. To me, it wasn't that different than Bombay, frankly in a very interesting way. But my parents were interesting. Whatever money they made, they kept moving through the different public school systems, right? Because that was the way you got better education. So in four, and literally in seven years, we moved through four different public school systems, each one having a better educational, uh, you know, was a wealthier public school system. Next. So uh, that's me around, I think, 13 or 14. Next. And uh, one of the things that happened was, this was a time in U.S. education where teachers, believe it or not, had quite a bit of power. The teachers I had had a standard curriculum, but they allowed me to excel because I was extremely ambitious because I knew the incredible opportunity I had in America. So by the time I was 14, I know a lot of smart people, I had finished calculus by the ninth grade. My high school had no other courses to offer. And my mom had seen this little newspaper cut out in a newspaper in New York, which said that 40 kids were going to get selected to go to NYU. And this is 1978. Everyone remember what a, what a role, what, what 1970 was like? What, could a, what were the roles that women had in 1978? Can you name them? Nurse, teacher, what else? Secretary or housewife, okay? And in 1978, computers used to fill this whole room you know, massive mainframe computers. And so here was an incredible professor at NYU who was gonna select 40 students who would get to learn uh, seven programming languages. And it was like an intensive course. My mom would drop me off around 6 a.m. at the PATH station. And as a 14-year-old kid, I'd take it to New York. Now, most parents are afraid to send their kids down, down the street these days. So it's an incredible environment. I finished that, and I got a full-time job working while in high school at Rutgers Medical School. 
in the heart of Newark, New Jersey, which many people still are afraid to go into. It's a fact. Um, so I initially, because I had this love of medicine, started, uh, there's a very interesting disease called sudden infant death syndrome. Are you familiar with this? Babies essentially get a hiccup, or what you call it, the, the, the breath uh, stops. It's called an apnea. And in 1978, Rutgers at that time had acquired some of the best data, longitudinal 48 hour sleep data. And uh, we were assessing what you would call today big data, looking at correlations of sleep patterns to see if you could connect it to the onset of an apnea. Ended up doing some interesting research. In fact, uh, several years later, I wrote a paper which I presented. But that got me very, very interested in pattern analysis, what you would sort of, the, the, the core of a lot of AI machine learning. But while I was at this university, as you were referring to, next, um, so in this university there were offices. And the uh, place I was working at, there was an incredible mentor called Dr. Les Michelson. And Dr. Michelson said, Shiva, I want to give you a challenge. I can see you can program. Now you've got to understand, in those days, um, Michelson had set up a network, not the ARPANET. You know, there were many networks, by the way, beyond the ARPANET. Um, it was a local area, net, wide area network between Newark, Piscataway, and New Brunswick, three different campuses of Rutgers. And Michelson had set this up as, on his own. He was a high energy experimental physicist from Brookhaven, and medical uh, departments were just starting to get into the area data acquisition, scientific data processing. And so Michelson, that's what he was working on. But in his lab, he was very much into building applications that could be used by others, everyday people, not just the nerds. And this person is obviously not a nerd. Um, but the secretary does this, go back to your day. Um, uh, this was her desktop. So anyone below the age of 40, there was at one time a physical desktop. And that desktop had an inbox, outbox, folders, attachments, uh, paper clips, Rolodex, you get the idea? There's a thing called a typewriter, next. You would write a thing called a memo, it may be hard to see this, but it had a very specific contract, uh, construct to, from, subject carbon paper was literally carbon paper. That's where CC came from. Blind carbon copy was if you wanted to let someone else know, but you didn't want their boss to know, that kind of thing. And then you had attachments. And what was fascinating was this was a system, the key word here is system. On those computers, there were simple methods of exchanging text messages. That's not what I'm talking about. And many companies, HP, in fact, uh, Westinghouse, um, Honeywell, had developed those systems. But what was fascinating about the system was this was a medium for collaboration. So if I wanted to hire, for example, Aaron, I'd write a cover letter, I'd attach his resume, and you'd forward it around. People would comment, and it came back, and you'd decide to hire that person. It was a medium for collaboration. Next. And this was put into what's called the inner office mail envelope. It was wrapped up, next, and it was put into these pneumatic tubes. You guys seen this? Okay, next. And this was the system for inner office communication. So in universities, you had either the telephone or this very complex system. So I was asked to convert this entire system to the electronic version. 50,000 lines of code used to work until 2 a.m. in the morning. And I called it email, a term never used before in the English language. And it wasn't just sort of, you know, a piece of code. It was used by hundreds of people, wrote the user's manual. So this 14-year-old kid was the developer, the trainer. You can go read Michelson's stuff. And that's what occurred in 1978. Next. And that's actually a picture of me. Now, what's fascinating is none of this would have been possible. There's a woman there. She just passed away, 93 years old. Stella Alexiak had fought with the administration of the school system to change the rules so this 14-year-old could, could go 30 miles and work. Unbelievable. And so email was invented not by the military industrial complex, which I'll get to, but in the collaboration of a loving family, an amazing set of dedicated teachers, and a great mentor. That's where this innovation came out of. And we'll talk more about it. Next. Um, that's actually the code which went into the Smithsonian, some of you may know, in September 2012. In those days, email was not an obvious term, by the way. There were other people doing simple text messaging. They didn't bother to call it email. They called it other words, text messaging. The reason I called it email was a Fortran language at a six-letter character limit, six-letter character limit. And the operating system, the Hewlett-Packard uh, 
Packard operating system only allowed five characters. That's how email came. Um, and I'll get back into electronic mail versus email. By the way, the word electronic mail has been used all the way since the 1800s, which is the electronification or sending messages through electronic and electrical devices. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the email, the system as we all know and use today. Thanks. By the way, it gets more interesting. I came to MIT, and I remember, uh, I, I took, could you go a couple slides ahead? One more slide. Yeah, so this was, go back. So this was the, nope, one forward. So this was the September 2nd, 1981, uh, Jesus, it's almost um, 36 years ago, 10 days before. But it, it, you know, it's an interesting article, this was in Tech Talk, and it uh, talked about the class of 85. This is an 81 coming in, and it described three very interesting students who had done something of note. And one of them, next slide, was this kid who built this electronic mail system. So MIT obviously thought this was interesting. Go back, Ricky. Go back. So when this happened, I don't know if Dr. Gray is still here at MIT, Paul Gray? Uh, previous slide, please. Uh, Dr. Gray was a president of MIT then, and I, was, uh, I got involved in student politics, was the freshman student body council president. And I went to Dr. Gray's house that winter, December 1981, and Dr. Gray said something interesting. He goes, Shiva, it's unfortunate the Supreme Court doesn't recognize software patents. This is 81 now. He said you should copyright it. And let me tell you the background. This is why um, I think it's important that you know engineers, scientists participate in governance because what was happening was in 1976, the only way that you could protect like a piece of music, novels, was through copyright law. When software started coming, uh, the uh, politicians or the bureaucrats were trying to figure out what, what do we do with this? And they thought it was sheet music. Right, because I remember coming to MIT, people, my mechanical engineering professor said, what is this software you're doing? Even at MIT, there was, the value of it wasn't there. It was like you were typing something on a computer. So in 1980, the US Copyright Office had passed the Computer Act of 1980, which said that you could use copyright law to protect software. Get it? So here's a problem with copyright law. It only protects the literal work. So if I wrote email and all the designs, all the ideas are not protected, only the literal work. But that's what was available. And it wasn't a trivial thing as some, unfortunately, uh, people have mistakenly said is putting a C with a circle. You had to send away all your code. You, there was no PDFs. You had to order the form. You had to pay your $10, filled it out, submitted it back and forth on August 30th, 1982. Next slide. I was issued the first US copyright for email. So here's a young teenager at MIT, wrote all the code, called it email, and has the first US copyright, which was the only way to recognize software inventions. There's no controversy here. Who invented email? Next slide. Um, keep going. So I'll come back to this, but that's what I did as a kid. And that was done, not at MIT, but in Newark, New Jersey, in the ecosystem of what I just shared with you. And there are great things that also appear, and I'll talk to you about one. So I went in and out of MIT, four degrees, as Aaron said, started seven different companies. By the way, I've always held a job since I was 14 years old. Even though I was going to grad school, I was always doing a, a, a consulting job of some kind. So I lived on campus at Fidel's, I bought my own home when I was, uh, I think, a junior. Lived uh, off campus, on campus, but I've been extremely entrepreneurial. Um, in 2000, in, 19, in early uh, 1900s, everyone remember when the web was first coming, 1993? Not the internet, the web. Um, email was used in the inner office environment. You don't need the internet, by the way, for email. Uh, it was used in the inner office environment in businesses. In 1993, when the web took off, Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail, those companies started coming and email became a consumer application. The White House was starting to get about around 5,000 emails a day. I was doing my PhD at the time. The White House runs a contest to see are there people who can automatically read and bucket an email, because the way the Clinton White House was doing it was they had interns, probably shouldn't use the word interns with Clinton, but they had um, <laughs> uh, emails would come in and the emails would get bucketed manually and they would send out a form letter. So the White House was looking for ways could you automatically do this Long story short, I ended up winning that contest as a student at MIT, left MIT, 
and started a company which I thought was only going to be a two-year stint, ended up becoming 10 years. That company is called Echo Mail. Made a ton of money, we grew to around 250 million in value. I had finished that in 2003 when I was strolling through uh, MIT Forbes Dewey. Uh, said, Shiva, you got to come back. There's a very interesting development taking place in biology. And your interest in computing and medicine uh, could be valuable. So this is what was happening. Some of you may have seen this graph. I don't know if you can see that number says 100,000 around 1991. I remember the Human Genome Project. When the Genome Project started, there was a very interesting, what I call a reductionist assumption, that what made a human being different than smaller organisms must be the number of parts. That we must have more genes, for example, right? It's a very interesting idea, right? So systems theory says, you know, uh, emergent properties, things emerge from the interconnection of parts, but the biologists really didn't understand systems. They thought, well, a worm has around 20,000 genes, Look how complex we are. We must have at least, I think the estimates were even higher than that, half a million genes. What you see over time here, the irony of the Genome Project is by the time the Genome Project ends, we have about roughly 19 to 20,000 genes. So this flipped biology on its head, and this is actually from uh, Peter Hunter's slide, who's between Oxford and Auckland, and Peter said, well, you know, we're not going to understand the whole physiome by just the genes. In fact, People now say that the, the number of genes are more like the number of keys on a piano keyboard. They're fixed. But what's really interesting is the fact that the interactions from the environment, perhaps with food we eat, other things can turn off and turn on genes. So the choreography of molecules is much more complex, just like if you have a, a set of uh, piano keys, and there's infinite songs you can play. So biology becomes a little more interesting beyond just the genes going across multiple spatial and temporal scales. And um, in 2003, next slide, uh, what was occurring with the National Science Foundation was there was a big um, challenge, which was could you mathematically model the whole cell? Next slide. And one way of looking at the cell is an interconnection of many different molecular species interacting together. Now, at MIT, some of the leaders, in the, in the, even in the BE department, were getting out of this in 2003 because they were able to do mechanistically maybe 30 or 50 pathways. It was too complicated. And that's when the comp size guys came in and they said, forget about doing all the mechanisms. Let's really focus on machine learning techniques. Treat this as a black box. Input, output, we'll do correlation machine learning, uh, you know, Bayesian networks, et cetera. And to me, when I looked at this problem, I said, you know what? This is really not a biology problem. Next slide. Um, this is really a distributed computing software problem, no different than enterprise software. And the way I looked at it, I said, look, you have, by the way, in biology, you know, you could win a Nobel Prize just for understanding how two proteins interact, right? Very complex. So what do biologists do? There's no a priori, it's not ab initio. There's no fundamental laws in biology, like F equals MA or, you know. We basically do experiments, and you try to evoke some understanding from those experiments and how things interact, and then you publish it. So, you know, in a publication, someone may have put this together, which are these uh, protein interaction networks and they'll publish it. Like this, in the field, there's, if you look at the array of literature, there's these little ball and stick diagrams. I like to call them the Monday night football diagrams. Well, in 2003, these small diagrams were starting to become mathematical models, albeit small ones, and people were writing them in all different formats. You know, uh, C, MATLAB, SPML, CellML, competing different uh, networks. Uh, people are using many different approaches, ODE, stochastic approaches. But the reality of the problem is um, what people were dissuaded by is it gets too complex when the networks become huge. So that's why people go to machine learning techniques. But is there a way that you could actually mechanistically do this? Next. So from a software engineering perspective, we said, look, the blue circle represents a cell. The individual pathways or represents a very complex phenomenon like apoptosis or something like that. Those individual pathways, we knew are models, and many of these are being owned by distributed research groups all over the world. So the idea really becomes, could you create a collaboratory? Could you create an environment where you could on the fly couple these models and let the individual owners own them? Aaron me? So it's a distributed problem versus trying to monolithically put this together. Next. So this was Cytosol. We created a whole infrastructure in the cloud where the models could be owned, and we used basic physics 
uh, where people could own and return. And, 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 and that's what, so email was the you know, electronic version of the inner office mail system. Cytosol was sort of the electronic version of the molecular communication system. Next. This, this was the basis of my uh, thesis. Um, we wrote tons of papers, but so 2003 to 7, we finished the work. 7 to 12, we had to, you know, you have to prove your, you have to validate yourself through peer review. So we, we, we wrote a, um, a lot of interesting stuff. Then Forbes, Professor Dewey and I, we spun out a company in 2012, which we call Cytosol. When we spun it out, we're trying to figure out what do we do with Cytosol. We clearly drug development is a big area. One of the interesting things that came out in Nature was this very interesting article saying that if you're going to solve cancer, you can't just give a single drug. You have to use combinations. And everyone, just to simply put, the reason combinations are important is that when you do drug development, you're working on two axes, efficacy and toxicity. You want to find the right dosage that works but doesn't kill the person, right? And now you start adding two drugs, three drugs. The factorial problem becomes too complex. The FDA, frankly, doesn't know how to deal with it. Um, you'd have to kill lots of animals. The clinical trials become difficult. So it clearly points to the need for using uh, computation. Paul Waxman was the uh, writer who wrote this article, uh, eminent guy in cancer research. But interesting enough, uh, we don't know any of these guys, so there's no inside job. Cytosol was the only uh, technology cited as the ability to do combination analysis. So we said interesting. So we raised about a million bucks in about two weeks. People, there's a lot of money out there, by the way and especially if you have a good idea. And what we said was, why don't we use Cytosol to actually see if we can take a disease and go end to end in 12 months and discover a combination, and we chose pancreatic cancer. Next. Now, just as an aside, remember the Indian background I have. In India, by the way, you'll find these people look at you and they'll formulate, I'm sure people from Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine also does this. Um, but here, we did a sort of a toy example just to let you know how this works. Next. Um, if you see that yellow, I hope you can see it says curcumin. Uh, about 15 years ago, a lot of research was done showing that in all of Asia, including China and India, the number one cause of death is liver disease. Indians, however, get one third less liver disease because they consume a lot of curry. The active ingredient in curry is an herb called turmeric, and the active uh, molecule of turmeric is curcumin. So there's been since then 6,000 papers written in the literature talking about how curcumin interacts. And what we did was we used Cytosol, we mined all those papers. And this is not just data mining, but the systems mining showing all the places curcumin interacts, and we mathematically modeled this. If you go to Whole Foods now, and you look at the inflammation medicines, you'll, people will have resveratrol, curcumin. And if you ask these guys, how did you come up with this in the nu nutritional supplements, there's a lot of hand waving. People don't really have, they say, well, some Chinese doctor told me how to do this, or some, my grandmother told me. So with Cytosol next, we similarly can do the same thing for Resveratol next. And we did this as a toy example to show, and this is, if you want to follow this, is simply the first line on the far right, if you see that 0.15, I'm simulating inflammation in the body. 0.15 is a cytokine, which is a inflammatory marker. I'm not giving any curcumin, any Resveratol. The next experiment in two, I give just curcumin. Everyone see that? You notice the inflammation goes down from 0.15 to point. 05. In the third experiment, I just give resveratrol. It goes from 0.15 to 0.06. But next slide, please. In the in the final example, I reduce the dosage dosage of curcumin by 40 percent, reduce the dosage of resveratrol by 60. But you get a 200 percent drop. This is called the synergistic effect. So in Eastern medicine, everyone talks about this. Oh, you know, we mix herbs because of synergy. You know, in, by the way, in Indian villages, everyone's curry is a little bit different, but you don't just get turmeric. You get turmeric with pepper, with cardamom. Pepper is actually increases the bioavailability of turmeric. So this is sort of ancient wisdom. Next. So we use the same process. We went through the 250 drugs for pancreatic cancer, or cancer. We identified 13 which were actually viable. We discovered, we went through 10 million combinations, 78 that were viable. We identified five that were optimized. And we actually found a combination which actually did better than gemcitabine in silica. Gemcitabine, by the way, is a gold standard. Then we did something interesting. We only were seven people. We said, why don't we apply for an investigational new drug with the FDA? It's a very complex process. You've got to hire your chief medical officer, your toxicologist. We applied. We submitted it. Ninety days into, we actually get a call from the FDA, and we thought they were rejecting us. And they said, you know, what you guys are doing is... Uh, what Janet Woodcock, who's the FDA director, wants to do in the 23rd century. They gave us allowance in 11 months, and we took the models 
and the technology, and we did a, uh, we spun this out, by the way, into a new company with MD Anderson, the most eminent cancer clinic in the United States. And like this now, with, tech, with this technology, we've spun out seven different companies. With Rudy Tanzi at Mass General, we created a company for Alzheimer's, with Forsyth Institute for Periodontal Disease, et cetera. It's a disruptive technology. And the way that we see leveraging this is in, a, in an asset management play, where, because you, know, you get more value when you go down different verticals. So that's side of salt. Next. By the way, that's our FDA allowance. Now the reason, the practical reason, this is extremely, and this is sort of your takeaway from this, is this is the drug development process, by the way. It takes about upwards of 13 to 15 years to create a single, get a drug to market. So by the way, no one discusses this in the Obamacare, Romney care debates, right? This is never talked about. Everyone talks about healthcare, 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 but the cost of drug development, getting down to the engineering of it from the time Someone in this room discovers a new compound, you gotta go through in vitro, kill a bunch of animals. That process takes around six years, seven years. Then you gotta get your IND filing, then you go to phase one, phase two, phase three, potentially seven to another nine years. How, how long is patent life? 10. 20 years. So if you discover something today, the clock starts ticking. By the time that comes out of that, let's say it took 15 years, you only have five years left, right? So this is why drug companies have to crank up that price especially if it's a small market. And the other problem with this model is it, it, it can't really handle precision medicine, personalized medicine, or for that matter, combination. Next. And uh, in many ways, drug development, the way it's done is the way that we used to do airplane development. You have a design, you throw a pilot in. If he fails, you say, gee whiz, if he succeeds, then you rationally explain why it all worked. It's rationalized drug development. It's really not rational. Next. And, uh, and if you further go into this, you'll find uh, that the, the reality is if the elephant represents some very complex biological function, you know the story of Buddha who brings in the six blind men and each one touches different parts. Um, well, this is how academic research frankly works. We don't really focus on the system. If the elephant represents some large scale disease, you get incentive for understanding the parts. Next. And if you were to work together, you get something like this, which doesn't look like anything near it. And this has a lot to do with the culture of academia, with what we incent in academia. It has to do with the fact there's no incentive to collaborate, frankly. The incentive is keep your data, get it published, get tenure. Next, move on. Seriously. And, uh, and this is where we're headed with this. Uh, you know, uh, healthcare is now 17% of GDP and it's growing. It's, you know, people talk about the defense budget, but this is really the operating system of why the healthcare model is not working. The drugs are too expensive. Next. So, and by the way, this is even more interesting. Companies, I mean, we have a lot of these R&D companies. Are we spending more and more in R&D year over year, and we're finding less and less new drugs? Next. So, anyway, Cytosol, if you guys are interested, this is a company. Uh, we're doing quite well. We're spinning off. So this, this is the merger of computing plus medicine. Now I'm going to bring it back to uh, uh, something uh, practical, controversial. Uh, this, so we had done Cytosol in 2014, this very interesting, did anyone see this? Anyone been here since 2014? Well, this article came in the front page of MIT Technology Review. Anyone know what this is making fun of? Everyone see Buy Fresh, Buy Local? Mm -hmm. And I thought this was fascinating. It said Buy Fresh, Buy GMO. And I'm saying, you know, it didn't look like it, it didn't look like a scientific article, it looked more like an ad to me. And as you read it, there's a preponderance of narrative in there saying, you know, the developing nations, India and China, must have GMOs, um, and you know, we should get over the fear of it. So I didn't know a lot about the background on this, and I started exploring it. Next. And um, it seemed like there was a huge controversy. Pro-GMO people and then the no, no GMO people, right? I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. And uh, so I wanted to see what the middle ground here was. Next, so we decided we'd apply cytosome. Now, to give you a background, um, the way genetically engineered foods, by the way, when I say genetically engineered foods, that too has become, in Europe, when they say genetically engineered foods, it's GMOs. Uh, it's not natural plant breeding. The press has been very clever about, frankly, making it quite nebulous, plant breeding, and versus asexual production, what occurs in the lab. And we have to be clear on that. 
But anyway, the way that a GMO goes out to market is based on a principle called substantial equivalence. Anyone heard of this? Okay, I'll explain it to you. So is basically, it's based on is there a difference between the non-GMO and the GMO version next? Um, just like is there a difference between Steve Banner, Nick Banner and, and Hulk Hogan next? Um, and if you look at this, uh, as I dwelled into this, what you find out was in 1976, Gerald Ford signed a guideline called substantial equivalence. Why did this come about? Well, they were doing it for a very good reason to support innovation. For example, it was done for medical devices. If Aaron and I started a company, let's say we made a stethoscope, it took us seven years to get through the FDA, and let's say we made just one itsy weeny teeny weeny change, like change the color. Well, the old model was you'd have to go through all the applications and get it through again. So substantial equivalence said, you know what? If you as a manufacturer can identify criteria, and you get to identify, by the way, the criteria, and denote what are the differences, and if they're within plus or minus 20%, you get fast track. Everyone understand what I'm saying? So that was substantial equivalence. It was done for medical devices. Next. Um, so when genetic engineering came, Michael Taylor, the former uh, senior vice president of Monsanto Science Policy, got uh, put in force by Obama uh, to be the uh, deputy director of the FDA. And Taylor said, well, let's use substantial equivalence guidelines. And the idea was, next, that, um, that if you and I, if, if, let's say we start a GMO company or genetically engineering of blueberries, we, what's fascinating is when you really read it, the FDA actually is very hands-off about this. We simply have to present to the FDA data saying that we conducted, conducted experiments in our own labs that criteria that we selected, fat content, color, whatever you want to do, and we found out they're about plus or minus 20%. We simply inform the FDA, and the FDA will send us what's called a quote-unquote safety consultation letter. And that letter basically says, thank you, Aaron and Shiva, for submitting this, period. And with that, you can go distribute the GMO crop. Everyone understand? There's no oversight like we do in pharmaceuticals. It's fascinating. And if you go onto the FDA site, there's about a probably now about 150 to 70 of these letters, but with that letter, and you don't frankly even need the letter. Next. So, uh, again, the manufacturer decides it, the characteristics. Next. So, what we did was we said, why don't we use Cytosol to bring some science into this quote-unquote controversy? So the first paper we wrote was we said, let's really look at plants and what's really going on and understand fundamental mechanisms. Um, there's a very interesting function in plants called C1 metabolism. Next slide. And this was a, and we, what we did was we went through 11,000 papers, and from that we mined um, three major molecular systems. Next. And what you find is all plants, fungi, and bacteria have this engine: methionine biosynthesis, methylation, and formaldehyde detoxification. Detoxification meaning plants undergo the cycle. Formaldehyde is produced during their process. It's evanescent because it's detoxified using a chemical called glutathione, which is an antioxidant. So that's a natural process. We publish this very quietly next, and we publish all the pathways next, next, next. No one said anything about this. We just got, you know, that was one of the base. The next thing we did was we used cytosol to actually do the in silico modeling. Next. So we took this and we ran it through cytosol. Next. Each of those subsystems as pathways, next, were integrated. And what we noticed, next, in the steady state case, what you're seeing is that blue line is glutathione is not depleted, it's maintained in a steady state value. Next. And um, formaldehyde is created, but it's evanescent and it's detoxed. Okay, and in fact, if we do some sensitivity analysis, you see this next slide, the same thing takes place. So, no problem, that paper is published. Next. But this is a system within many other subsystems, one of them being oxidative stress. So we now, having gotten those two out, we said, let's start looking at when plants undergo oxidative stress. For example, drought conditions, plants under massive stress, or pollution. Next. Um, and what we see here, next slide, is that similarly we went through the literature review. Next, we identified again uh, three or four major subsystems which are involved in oxidative stress. Again, they're and by the way, behind every circle and ball is probably hundreds of papers, all curated. So we're not making any of this up. This is all, this is not models in the sense where 
machine learning. These are actually from wet lab experiments. We have the kinetic rate constants. We're looking at the interaction. So every one of these lines, if someone wanted to do discovery, it's open source. We could actually go see where everything's coming from. Next. Same thing here. This is a glutathione pathway. Next. This is a ROS, reactive oxygen species. So we connected this to that, which means what happens when a plant undergoes oxidative stress. Next. Same thing, we put it all through cytosol. And what you see here, if the green line represents a normal case when plants are not undergoing oxidative stress, the red line, oops, previous, previous, where the plant actually goes to a different steady state level. Here we're not doing glutathione biosynthesis, so it goes to zero, but essentially the, the plant depletes its glutathione. Next. And similarly here, what you see is that formaldehyde does start accumulating. Okay, again, we publish this, no issues with this. Next. Similar cases here, sensitivity analysis. Now the fourth paper was the interesting one. There had been, you know, uh, hearsay data that some farmers were noticing high levels of formaldehyde in corn and soy, and no one had been really able to understand this. So we said, what happens when the genetic engineering of particularly soy takes place? Everyone familiar with Monsanto's model? There's a chemical called glyphosate. Everyone familiar with it? Roundup? Okay, so during the Vietnam War, Dow and Monsanto did Agent Orange, uh, which was essentially to create a chemical which you could drop on the Vietnamese, which would defoliate the leaves, so you could see the enemy. Well, what they really built out of that not was just Agent Orange, but the whole delivery mechanism, airplane, you know, dropping from the air. When factory farming became very valuable, or the, the quote-unquote norm, Monsanto started leveraging that. So if you're a farmer here, you would buy my weed killer, glyphosate, and you would get yields. Over time, what was happening was, not only was that weed killer, glyphosate, name brand Roundup, killing some of the soy or the corn, also, not in addition to the weeds. So Monsanto then said, you know what, let's develop our own soy, and they built what's called Roundup Ready Soy, RRS. Roundup Ready Soy would withstand the herbicide, and you as a farmer would also license the corn, I mean the, the soy seed. Now the licensing model is interesting, it's an annual license, like a software license. At the end of the year, you've got to re-up and buy the license again. If it flows into your farm and you're organic, you're going to have to pay me a license fee. And they've enforced this, it's gone all the way, for example, to the Canadian Supreme Court. Alright, so you're owning the herbicide, but you're also owning the license to re-up on the the, the, uh, the seeds. Next. So what we said was, is there a difference? Next. So we went through, again, the, the known science that we could find. None of this we're making up. And we found four very interesting enzymes because, remember, the, this uh, genetic engineering actually came from a particular bacterium. We found four enzymes that uh, were upregulated, including one uh, ROS species. We plugged this into the model. Next into the genetic modification, which affected oxidative stress. We adjusted all the pathways. Next, next, next. Put it all together, ran it through, and what we noticed was in the genetically engineered plant, formaldehyde would accumulate. Next. And then we noticed in the non-GMO case, you know, it evanescently gets detoxed, it accumulates. Next. And glutathione also gets depleted in the GMO case. Next, et cetera. So we published this. So when we published this, uh, I was vehemently attacked by a guy called Kevin Folta, University of Florida, the chairman of the horticultural department. He said, this guy didn't invent email, he's a fraud. And uh, that's all he said. Nothing about the rate constants, nothing about the molecular pathways, just personal attacks. Um, coincident to this, something interesting was going on. A organization in uh, California called US Right to Know had issued FOIAs. Everyone know what a FOIA is? Freedom of Information Act on the University of Florida because it's a public institution. 4,000 emails came out, and throughout this, Folta, chairman of the horticultural department, is telling everyone, I have nothing to do with Monsanto, I'm an independent scientist, I'm just here to make sure science is being done right. Well, one of the emails is an email from Monsanto with a $25,000 check for him to be their spokesman. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, and while this is going on, we continued. We further mined papers, and we were very fortunate. Next, keep going. Uh, we published our sixth paper where we were actually able to validate our predictions 
Fortunately, people in UK had, in a greenhouse, grown soy. Next slide. And you'll see here, this was a study. Next. Um, this is what they had found. In vivo, 9.9 .9 levels of, there's a marker for glutathione. And in the transgenic uh, Roundup Ready 3.7, and you can see what we found also. But behind our numbers, we have the mechanisms to explain why. Next. After this was published around the same time, a bunch of articles started coming out. Finally, the New York Times wasn't just cutting and pasting stuff. You know, stuff starts coming out saying that, you know, academics are being paid off. In fact, one of the guys is down at Harvard, who was literally got an abstract and cut and pasted it. Next. So is this political? Is it controversial? Of course it is. But this is a reality that did take place and, and continues to take place in academia. Next. Um, this one's great. These emails show Monsanto leading up professors to fight the GMO PR war. Look, I'm not pro or anti-GMO. What I do know for a fact is there's no real safety assessment standards for GMOs. And we should have some. You know, it took a while for us to realize x-rays are great technology, but, you know, we need to shoot it. Okay? And I think there's many opportunities with this. And in closing, let me just share with you next um, something about, I want to close on... Um, this is my mom. Uh, my mom was an incredible woman. Came from nothing. In 2011, you know, I didn't make a penny off email, guys. I, don't, I never wanted fame or the fortune of this or any of that. When my mom was dying of a horrible disease called pulmonary fibrosis, you have very few months to live. It's a horrible disease, scarring of the uh, lungs. Um, 2011, my mom presents me with a suitcase. And in that suitcase, next is all of these wonderful materials from 1978. All the computer code, all the tapes, all the documentation, which I had forgotten about. Next slide. And uh, Time Magazine, Doug Ameth, by the way, a real journalist who actually came by and looked at all the materials, Doug wrote this article called The Man Who Invented Email, November 2011. After that, the Smithsonian wanted all my materials, and it went into the Smithsonian on February 16th, 2012, literally a month after my mom had died. And you would think this should be a celebration of the American dream, but this is what took place. Next slide. People took my official MIT picture. This was Gizmodo and Gawker called me a, you can read the names, all sorts of horrible names. Next slide. And it doesn't get funny because this is 2012. This is not Jackie Robinson. People write this kind of stuff. <laughs> And none of you guys may know about this, but that's what I endured in 2012 and 13. I want you to see this. This is America 2012. So what did I do? So as, and now by the way, let me, next slide. Now, Wikipedia, people went on Wikipedia, started destroying any accomplishment I'd ever done. How dare this guy say he invented email? And I got this letter from a Wikipedia editor. He said, I seem to have stepped into a mess by accident. As an experienced Wikipedia editor, I had a look at the email article and was surprised that you hadn't received any credit for your contributions. Since I've had a great deal of experience in writing Wikipedia articles, I got right to work and added several suitable additions to provide credit to your contributions. Right away, my edits were deleted without discussion. Not edited to improve them, but just flat out deleted. This is a kind of behavior an editor encounters when editing an article on the Second Amendment abortion, or other extremely hot topics. The response to my edits have included personal attacks calling me quote-unquote ignorance, quote-unquote reckless, and the like. Although most editors have been less insulting than, they have generally been aggressive and rapidly deleting them. So why did this guy say this? And I talked to this guy. He's, he's an anonymous guy. If people want to eventually do an investigation, they can. Very senior guy. Second Amendment and the abortion. What's going on? Why did I have to endure all that nonsense? Next. And what you find is behind this is an elite academic group called Six CIs, headed by a guy called Thomas Hay, who thinks he owns a history on email. He owns computing history up in Wisconsin, which, by the way, produces all the computer historians. They think they have the hegemony on all, all, everything. And in this article, never called me, he attacks me, abuses me, and thanks 40 people for helping him write the attack on me. Next slide. Half of the people are from Raytheon, BB&N, who, by the way, thinks they invented everything. 
And what's, by the way, anyone studying marketing here? Any business people? Okay, let me teach you something about marketing because I used to do the back end for Nike. This is a beautiful marketing piece. You see that logo, the ad symbol? It's like the Nike swoosh, okay? This says, Raytheon, by the way, bought BBNN in 2009. In 2009, when the market crashed, post 9-11, the five major defense companies, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed, you can go down the list, all got into cybersecurity. Major business. Why? Because missile sales were dropping. Cybersecurity was a $70 billion movement. Um, uh, BBNN had done stuff in acoustics. Raytheon bought BBNN. This is called a rebranding exercise. Rebranding. Nice logo. That guy looks like a nerd. He must have invented email. Beard, glasses. Excuse my point of factor, but I want to make a point here. Madison Avenue style picture. Three months after I went to the Smithsonian, they award him the inventor of email by a group created called the Internet Hall of Fame, which gets registered seven days after I went into the Smithsonian. <laughs> so anyway, I, I started trying to find lawyers because my reputation is being attacked. I was teaching one of the most popular electives. No one at MIT stood up for me, except, next slide, and I'll come back to Chomsky bit, because Noam looked at the data. Anyone know Noam Chomsky? But what people forgot was they weren't just talking to a guy who was an inventor or scientist. I've been a fighter because I've had to fight. In 2007, I went to India after my Fulbright. When I was finishing it, I was appointed by the Prime Minister of India. That's called the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research to be the head of innovation for that institute. Next. And within three months, I had a beautiful bungalow in Delhi appointed a scientist level eight, the highest level you can get. My father-in-law at the time said, you know, no one gets this until they're in their 60s in Delhi, prime real estate. And, I real and so after about three months, I realized that they just brought in the MIT guy because this institution was massively corrupt. For 70 years, they hadn't created anything. And the innovators in that institution, a lot of smart Indian guys, were suppressed. By the way, do you know Gobind Karana, the guy who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine? Do you know in India you couldn't even get a job as an instructor? How many Nobel Prize scientists has India created within India? Anyone know? Since post-colonialism? Zero. Two during colonialism. So you find massive corruption, massive nepotism. So I said, I'm not going to sit here. I write a, an, a, a report which exposes the corruption, also provided solutions. Next slide. Great article got released to the press. Next, within five, with, I was evicted from my home. My email was shut off. Next. And under death threats, a bunch of articles came out. Next. Um, you know, mainstream news. When, this was an interesting thing. I, was, I had to give this talk uh, to India's number one network, and they said, you know, if you do this, you're going to get arrested. And I called the U.S. Embassy, and they said, and I said, what should I do? They said, you should come here, Dr. Igre. And all I could think about was my grandparents who had nothing. And that if I wasn't going to say something then, what kind of person was I? I did the interview. Next. And then my father-in-law was keeping tabs because he used to be in the, in the cabinet. And I left India, crossed, literally took a third-class train, 36 hours, crossed the border to Nepal, went to Qatar, Great Britain came home. The day I got home, the editor of Nature asked me to write a commentary next about, they said, you know, we've been watching this institution for 70 years. So I said, innovation demands freedom. Why America innovates in India may never. The article get published. After it got published, the editor of Nature India gets threatened by the prime minister's office. She's freaking out. She pulls down the article. Fortunately, it's out there. And that's what, that's what happened in India. So I had had an experience facing a massive situation like that. Okay? This was just years before. Next. By the way, the chief scientist of India, one of the most eminent guys, next slide, wrote to the prime minister and said, you know, you should meet with Shiva. It would be an honor. It would be a great loss for India. Prime minister never met with him. The Gandhi family goes back for seven generations of corruption. Modi is a pretty interesting guy. He came from nothing. You know? Next. Um, what people also didn't know is that I've actually always been involved in politics because maybe it was the oppressive caste system I came from. I mean, if there are any psychologists, you can do your analysis. Maybe it was when I was five years old, I was given water in a different cup and told not to enter people's homes. So I knew apartheid in India. But that's a picture of me on the steps of the student center burning the South African flag because MIT had investments in South Africa in the 1980s. Next slide. And that's me challenging Paul Gray. Next, and that's me making sure when an MIT physicist was 
put in jail by the Sri Lankan government, we fought and finally got him out. Next. And that's me on my PhD graduation saying U.S. out of Iraq. Half of the crowd booed me. The other half thought I was saying something valuable. I didn't understand why we were fighting this war. So I had a little bit of experience, you see, fighting. So I wasn't willing to just be a good Indian, quote unquote, a good Indian. Next. So what, what did we do? We put on our activist hat. One of my students, Devin Sparks, we literally, when you're attacked like this, you actually start thinking maybe you did something wrong. We went through every paper written prior to 1978 in the MIT microfiche. Went through all of them. And next slide. And what we found uh, was something fascinating. This guy, David Crocker, who again thinks he's a pine internet pioneer, forgot in December 1977, six months before I created email, he had written something fascinating. Can everyone see this? It says, at this time, no attempt is being made to emulate a full-scale interorganizational mail system. That's the interoffice mail system. Two minutes? Uh, sure. Okay. He said, the fact that the system is intended for use in various organizational contexts and by users of differing expertise makes it almost impossible to build a system which responds to all users' needs. You see, these guys were doing simple text messaging. They never thought a secretary, when they say users of differing expertise, could actually move from the typewriter to the key keyboard. Next. Chomsky, uh, if you go rewired, Noam came out on this. He said it's pretty clear. And in the midst of this, in closing, what I want to let you know is Walter Isaacson, you may know him, very liberal writer, writes great stuff. 2014, this book gets commissioned. It's called Innovators of the Digital Revolution. Look, I've never played the race card in my life, but I'm going to show you something that's so egregious. Next. These are Innovators of the Digital Revolution. Next. Next. You see a pattern? I'm sorry. Uh, he ends with this guy, Vannevar Bush, great guy, started Raytheon. And what Walter alludes to next, he, everyone remember Eisenhower when he left office said we should beware of the military industrial complex, the military industrial academic complex. Next. And he says all great innovations come out of the golden triangle of this. Now, next, previous, previous, previous. Now, remember, we're all part of this. MIT is a great institution, don't get me wrong. But that image, next slide. Doesn't sort of fit, does it? <laughs> Next. And by the way, Philo Farnsworth, this is not only a race issue, I'm not saying it's race, but Philo Farnsworth did invent the first TV, did it in Franklin, Idaho, in a small town, and he was vilified. And finally, 60 years later, there's a statue of Philo Farnsworth in Congress. Next. So I want to end by saying that this is not new. If you go, uh, you, previous great thing, if you go, there's a great movie when you guys have a chance to see Inside Job. Great story about Michigan, a professor who wrote a great article in nice point font saying that you know the Icelandic economy was unstable, and then two months later it crashed, and then he changed his, I mean it was stable, and it exposes this academic collusion. Next. And uh, many years ago, next, Noam gave me this great book to read, uh, which is about the Golden Holocaust, how for 50 years scientists and industry colluded to say smoking was good for you. Next. So look, next slide, I want to end by saying, look, this is not about just the invention of email. This is about all of us. What is the kind of world we want to create? What is the kind of world we want to create? We can be you know, great scientists, but you know what? We're not going to advance society unless we realize that we are participants and we have to be participants in governance and understanding these issues of where the money flows and who's involved in making these decisions. Next. And I want to end with the word entrepreneur. Everyone know where it comes from? Next. People think it comes from Old French. There's a very interesting word in the Indian Sanskrit text called antaprerana. It's about 3,000 years old. Antaprerana. Next. And it says, next, it says, driven by insight. It says, you are what your deep driving desire is. As your desire is, so is your will. As your will is, so is your deed. And as your deed is, so is your destiny. To me, being a creator, being an innovator, being an entrepreneur is about exercising the full notion of being human. So the invention of email story is not about me. It's about who's an innovator, who isn't, who's anointing that, and what does that mean to all of us as citizens of this world. Thank you. Talk a little bit about kind of like the attacks you felt 
And I think it's interesting that you mentioned the rally in the beginning of the speech, but I think it was clear for everyone that it's not just that uh, the rally happened, you're actually there at the rally uh, with the kind of like white supremacists that were there. And I kind of identify what you said. I spent the last year hearing from a guy on TV that I was a rapist and a murderer, and that I could never be a, a judge because my last name is Hispanic. And yet, you, you, I, I, I heard your speech. I actually went on YouTube and I heard your speech. And you spent the whole time saying how, oh no, we're not the racist ones. The racist ones is the rest, but we're nice, but yet the people you defend politically and the kind of like ideas you had, uh, kind of like it's like both my, you know, my Hispanic identity, both my Jewish identity with all the neo-Nazis that were protesting that day, and you felt comfortable with that. I, I was wondering if you could be also willing to kind of like talk a little bit about that and why you think it's okay to kind of like hang out with neo-Nazis. And you actually said uh, that day uh, on your speech as well that, you know, there was a woman that was murdered by a neo-Nazi the week before, but yet the real criminals are the academics. So how does also that Yeah, fit it's a great with, question. Uh, so, so, with the work that you do here. Sure, uh, great question. So first of all, that speech, and I get invited to a lot of things two months before that I was invited to it. And do you know the details of the organizer? So let me give you the details. High school students, 16, 17 year old kids, amazing kids. If you haven't met them, you should probably call them up and talk to them. And young college students. They said, look, we, want, we believe what's occurring in America is a very limited spectrum. We want to have a full discussion of, uh, uh, of a spectrum of political ideals, talks. So I said, great. Forgot about it. When Charlottesville occurred, everyone there was branded a neo-Nazi, including me. A brown-skinned Indian guy, a neo-Nazi? Come on. Yeah, and a white supremacist. Well, let, let, me, let me finish. Who was on the speakers list? If you actually go look at it, myself, two women, and by the way, we have three people right there. I don't know if you were in the gazebo. What's fascinating was the permit was supposed to be given for 100 people in the gazebo and it was supposed to be accessible to everyone to hear. When we went there, the gazebo was cornered off with a 20-foot radius, fencing, and then a buffer zone with another 100-yard 100 100 radius. Who did this? Mayor Walsh and uh, Baker. Why? Because politicians don't care about truth. They care about pandering when it's convenient for them. So what they've done was, they branded us neo-Nazis, and they realized we weren't. There was a Green Party guy there, there were three or four black people there, people of all different religious backgrounds. That's what I saw, and if you look at it, there's a panoramic picture. There were no neo-Nazis in there. Was Absolute it, lie. Was it in Charlottesville? I'm not talking about Charlottesville, I'm talking about Boston, where I was at. We don't cancel. And what I'm, what I'm saying is, if you hear my talk, what I talked about was, you know what? Let's talk about who a white supremacist is, and I'm talking as a person of color. It's easy to call a guy in a, in a, in a, in a uh, pillowcase with two eyes and a swastika a white supremacist, right? But why don't we call, if people were asking me, why are you on the stage like you are with these people? Well, did everyone ask that of Jimmy Carter? Jimmy Carter said we need ethnically clear, uh, clean neighborhoods. Do you know that? Yeah, but what about... Wait, wait, wait. I, I don't defend you. No, no, no. My point is, in that gazebo, if people had heard our talk, we're no white supremacists. We live in an era right now you can destroy people's characters like that. You can call, label people. Why don't, you know, Hillary Clinton is the one who said that black children are super predators. I consider her a white premise, uh, uh, supremacist. What Joe Biden said the only reason he was going to vote for... Obama was because he was, he was the first clean and articulate black man. You see, we give get out of jail free cards because someone over here is deciding to label people. And that is not what America is about. That's not what the First Amendment is about. The foundations of this con the Constitution of this country are that, look, in Harvard Square 20 years ago, people could put a soapbox and talk. You didn't throw acid at them. You just walked away. But what is your opinion about Trump? My opinion about, I'll talk about Trump. I, so here's my, here's my politics. And if you really want to study politics, let's really study it. And I'll congeal it into the following. There is always three dynamics in, if you look at the history of politics. The establishment, those people who want to keep things as they are, change agents, people who you may call uncouth, Green Party, Communist Party, right, whatever you want to call them. They're people out on the streets who are trying to make a living. They don't have the voice of the establishment. And then there's a third group, which I call the most insidious group, the not-so-obvious establishment. 
The not-so-obvious establishment is a group that acts as though they care for these people for change, that they'll use the words revolution, change, hope, follow what I'm saying? But when they actually exist to take the energy out of the establishment, I mean out of the change agents and bring it back to the establishment, I'll give you an example. When I was a student at MIT, I thought, hey, maybe uh, Jesse Jackson's pretty cool. This is 1984. Jesse Jackson was running on his own party called the Rainbow Party. The candidates were Ronald Reagan and Walter Mondale. And we were all for Jesse. And you know what Jesse Jackson does? There was a movement building on the streets. He takes all of that energy and he gives, he says, you know what? We can't build our movement. We need to give it to Mondale because Reagan's horrible. This, this very fascistic concept of Tweedledee and Tweedledum, as though we can only have two parties in this country. And that's the day I said I will never vote for any of these politicians because Republicans and Democrats are two sides of the same coin. Come Trump, fast forward. Hey, this guy's pretty interesting. And by the way, he was the first one to start attacking the media. He didn't have to do that on that national stage. He was a disruption because what has occurred in this country is the elites, right along here on the East Coast, and Hollywood, you know, I've been in Hollywood, if you look at my history, they all think they're the smart guys. Everyone else is stupid. And, and what Trump was doing is he was a necessary disruption. That's my position on Trump. So you agree with his vision on Hispanic people as well? I agree with what? His vision on Hispanic people as His well. what on Hispanic people? The view that we are rapists and murderers. That no, I don't agree with that. Name, no, but I'm saying he was a, but I don't agree with Hillary Clinton too, but I'm saying he was a necessary disruption. And if you think Hillary Clinton should be elected, Continue, I'm saying it was a necessary disruption because what it's done is create opportunities for other people to start thinking about running. Because what we have is lawyers and lobbyists who run. And we need, you know, the founders of this country were blacksmiths, inventors, architects, a vision was there was a creator, and everyday people were supposed to be involved in governance. And what we've created is career politicians. That's not what the vision was. 